When we take blood pressure at the brachial artery with the cuff on the arm, we are only taking the pressure of the systemic circuit, not the pulmonary, and we're only taking pressure of an artery and not veins. So looking back at the cardiac cycle, we know that there's systolic pressure, and that's when the heart is at its like maximum pump action, creating the most pressure. And we're gonna, for default sake, call that 120 millimeters of mercury. We also know that when the heart is at rest, that's when there's the lowest pressure, which is 80 millimeters of mercury, right? And this pressure, the diastolic, it really results from afterload or the back pressure on the aortic valve. We can actually calculate a mean between uh, the systolic and diastolic pressure. To do that, we have to calculate the pulse pressure, which is the difference between systolic and diastolic. And in this situation would be 40 millimeters of mercury. Okay, we're going to start talking about blood pressure. And on this slide are things that students fail to consider when we take quizzes or tests. These are things that I find that students are forgetting when we take a quiz or a test on blood pressure. So you have to remember that vessels are a closed system. What this means is that the blood in your vessels is in your vessels, unless you have a vessel that is bleeding out onto you. Um, there should be the same amount of blood leaving the heart from both sides and going back to it. The heart is the pump here. So when we think about blood pressure, the heart creates the force that pushes blood through the vessels. Vessels themselves cause resistance. And it's the agreement between number two and number three that actually creates blood pressure. So the heart creates force and arteries, most notably arterioles, create resistance to oppose that force. Many students forget that veins are reservoirs, that a majority of our blood, about 60%, exists in our veins, and that veins can take on more blood without increasing blood pressure. The other thing that students tend to forget has something to do with chapter 20, which is that cardiac output accounts for the volume of blood entering the vessels. So this kind of relates back to number two on this slide. Everybody freaks out at this slide because it has like little math in it, but it's really simple once you consider um, some of the basic things that create this. What we're talking about here is blood flow. And number one, for blood to flow, you have to create enough pressure to overcome resistance. And I like this picture up here because it shows you your vessel as like a balloon and the cardiac output or systole from the heart is creating the pressure and that's P in the center there. And then your vessels are like that little hand pinching the balloon and that's resistance. So on the left side of the diagram, you have to create pressure to overcome the resistance on the right side of the diagram. And of course, when you do that, when you create enough pressure to overcome resistance, your blood will actually flow through your vessels. So blood flow is encouraged by cardiac output and the creating of pressure during systole. 
And what this does is create a gradient. Think about this for a second. Blood flows from the high pressure in your arteries to the low pressure in your vessels. And that's the top number on this divisional sign here. Resistance has to do with vasoconstriction or vasodilation. Are you resisting that difference in pressure? Or are you dilating and letting all of the blood flow according to that difference in pressure? In math, in chemistry, in other sciences, we indicate difference as a triangle. So that's delta. So what we have here is that the difference in pressure, delta P, is encouraging blood flow, while resistance, R, is discouraging blood flow. Think about this for a second. If the pressure increases, if the heart is able to contract harder or create more contractility, flow will increase, right? If resistance increases, if all of your blood vessels constrict, then flow will actually decrease to your peripheral tissues. Don't be afraid of these two graphs either. Uh, they, they show you something that you already know. Let's look at the top graph. The top graph is showing you the same thing along the horizontal axis that we're going to travel from the aorta through the arteries, through veins to the vena cava. And as you do so, blood vessels get small, right? We go to capillaries, but then they get big again and really big. The vena cava is a lot bigger in diameter than the aorta. The other thing that we know is that the average blood pressure goes down as we go from the aorta to the vena cava. This is the pressure gradient, and blood flows down the gradient from high pressure in the aorta to low pressure in the vena cava. Okay, so what, what really does create pressure? And if you look down at this diagram down here, it's a little complicated at first, but we're going to read it from left to right. At the left, we see that we have the ventricles, right? And they're going to create a stroke volume, and that volume is going to open up those valves that are indicated there. And the blood is going to enter into the aorta and the elastic arteries, right? And that's what you see there that's ballooning out. Those arrows indicate that the aorta and elastic arteries will actually expand when the heart ejects blood into them. Over in the arterioles, we see that those vessels, the arterioles, they're the ones that provide resistance. So we have to create enough pressure at the heart to overcome the resistance of the arterioles. So in the end, pressure that the heart generates through contractility, it's a, it's a function of systole, right? It's systole that maximum pumping that creates the pressure to push blood into the aorta, right? And one thing that pressure depends on is how much blood gets pushed into the aorta, and that's cardiac output, right? How much blood per minute. We also have to consider how much force, right? The heart's going to generate contractility to push the blood into the aorta, that's force. And then we have to consider how elastic your arteries are. If you're young and if you're healthy, your aorta and your elastic arteries are going to expand and they're going to allow that pressure to kind of dissipate through the systemic circuit. If you have calcification on your aorta and it doesn't expand, when the blood enters the aorta, it's actually going to increase from the pressure that caused systole. What we're talking about here, all of these pressures and everything, so really, pressure is termed total peripheral resistance. In, in your book, there are lots of different terms, depending on if we're talking about um, pressure in the aortas and the veins and the total circuit, which circuit. We're going to call it total peripheral resistance. This is determined by three very specific things in vessels. So it is determined by systole, but let's move into vessels now. Vessels can have vascular resistance. Vessels can have blood in it that has varying viscosity. And vessels can have turbulence. We're going to look at these three things in the next three slides. 
Vascular resistance is both difficult and easy to understand. If you don't understand it, I don't care. Just memorize these rules. <laughs> All right, so vascular resistance is friction that happens as blood passes through and touches the vessel wall. So it's kind of like friction as you drag something across the ground. And as you drag something across the ground, it's very difficult. But if you put wheels on something, there's less friction. It becomes a lot easier. Okay, so number one, let's consider the hose on the left side of the diagram. And as the hose becomes longer, there's more resistance from the water flowing through it, and thus pressure goes up. This is actually easy to remember, because as you grow from a baby to an adult, your blood pressure naturally increases because your vessels simply get longer. The diagram on the right shows you a large PVC pipe, or a large pipe. I don't know if that's PVC. I can't tell. So it shows you a pipe that is large in diameter. And think about um, blood, blood flowing through a vessel that's very large or vasodilating. Blood flows through it very easily with le less pressure, resistance, and friction. If you were to vasoconstrict that di diameter, there would be more friction and there would be more vascular resistance and blood would flow, slow down flowing through that pipe. The next thing to consider is blood viscosity. So viscosity is the resistance to flow. Maple syrup is viscous. Molasses is even more viscous. Motor oil is viscous. Um, detergents are viscous. They have a resistance to flow. So when your blood has a low viscosity, when it's nice and watery and you're well hydrated, that's the uh, diagram over here on the right side of this blood vessel. Your red blood cells kind of line up and they all file through the blood vessel and there's not a lot of friction or resistance. When you are dehydrated, your viscosity increases and your little red blood cells, there's lots of them, and per volume, and they start to bump into each other. And thus they bump into each other, they bump into the vessel wall, and that creates resistance and pressure. The last thing to consider is turbulence, which many students confuse with vasoconstriction. Turbulence is how your blood flows through the vessels, and it has to do with plaque deposits that you can see here in the diagram on the left. Turbulence increases your blood pressure or resistance, and it really does a number on afterload, especially when turbulent plaques are located in the vessels near the heart. So um, turbulence plaques, plaques are like permanent vasoconstriction, and you can kind of see that over here in the diagram on the right. So you've got vasoconstriction working against you, creating more pressure, and then you've got this turbulence working against you and creating more pressure. So turbulence is like um, viscos high viscosity and small vessel diameter all wrapped up in one. It's great. The last thing to consider is turbulence, which many students confuse with vasoconstriction. Turbulence is how your blood flows through the vessels and it has to do with plaque deposits that you can see here in the diagram on the left. Turbulence increases your blood pressure or resistance, and it really does a number on afterload, especially when turbulent plaques are located in the vessels near the heart. So um, turbulence plaques, plaques are like permanent vasoconstriction, and you can kind of see that over here in the diagram on the right. So you've got vasoconstriction, working against you, creating more pressure. And then you've got this turbulence working against you and creating more pressure. So turbulence is like um, viscos high viscosity and small vessel diameter all wrapped up in one. It's great. Okay, so now that we looked at those three things that can occur in vessels to increase or decrease the blood pressure, there's something to know about blood pressure about the organ that really control it. And the kidney is the master control. It is. The kidney is like a bottleneck 
got lots of tiny little capillaries. It's under high pressure and about 25% of your cardiac output goes to your kidney. So it, it really is the final determiner of blood pressure. Your heart plays in blood pressure because it creates the systole. And of course your vessels play in blood pressure because they create the resistance. There are some physical forces that control blood pressure like your cardiac output, how much blood per minute from the heart, your peripheral resistance, which is that um, vascular resistance, viscosity, and turbulence. And then of course, we haven't really talked about this, but how much blood you actually have in your body, right? Um, if you've ever been bloated, you know that you have a lot of it at that time. If you've ever been sorely dehydrated, you don't have enough of it. So volume can play a difference. Okay, so now that we looked at those three things that can occur in vessels to increase or decrease the blood pressure, there's something to know about blood pressure about the organs that really control it. And the kidney is the master control. It is. The kidney is like a bottleneck. It's got lots of tiny little capillaries. It's under high pressure and about 25% of your cardiac output goes to your kidney. So it, it really is the final determiner of blood pressure. Your heart plays in blood pressure because it creates the systole. And of course your vessels play in blood pressure because they create the resistance. There are some physical forces that control blood pressure like your cardiac output, how much blood per minute from the heart, your peripheral resistance, which is that um, vascular resistance, viscosity and turbulence. And then of course we haven't really talked about this, but how much blood you actually have in your body, right? Um, if you've ever been bloated, you know that you have a lot of it at that time. If you've ever been sorely dehydrated, you don't have enough of it. So volume can play a difference.